Okay, so we'll talk about now how fats play into the diabetes role. There are good fats and there are bad fats. And please hear me out to the end of the lecture before you really decide, well, what is good fats and what is bad fats. But the good fats, typically we say that the good fats are the monounsaturated fats, ones like flaxseed oil, olive oil, um, others that have more controversy are canola, safflower, and peanut. But it's supposed to improve uh, good cholesterol and have possible benefits for a person with diabetes if eaten in moderate quantities. Okay, so you can't go hog wild on these. We have to limit our intake of those. It is a refined food product, and just like sugar, it requires vitamins, minerals, nutrients to metabolize it. When we don't take the vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and things into our body to metabolize it, we set ourselves up for inflammation and free radical formation and other problems. So um, it's best if it's eaten in its normal state. And that's how it occurs in nature. The second best kind of fats are, are supposedly polyunsaturated fats. Things like corn oil, cottonseed oil, peanut oil, soy oil, sunflower, etc. Mackerel, salmon, and cod also have some uh, mono, I mean polyunsaturated fats in them and are touted to be good. Uh, some people make a big distinction between omega-3s and omega-6. If you eat a high-fat diet, then definitely you want to get your omega-3s, which come in some of these fats right here. But if you eat the foods as they come naturally, you don't have to worry about it. Don't sweat it for a minute. Uh, nature will take care of itself. But it is a refined food product as well. Same caution here. Uh, any fat eaten in high quantity will cause increased insulin resistance. So this has to be done in, uh, in moderation. And actually, this said small quantities for the polyunsaturated. Mon moderate quantities for the monounsaturated, small quantities for the polyunsaturated. Then we have what we call the bad fats. And uh, uh, pretty loosely, these are saturated fats because they all cause inflammation and they all worsen cardiovascular disease. They all increase insulin resistance and they are typically found in animal products. Then we have trans fats and trans fats are these engineered fats where we've taken some of the mono or the polyunsaturated and we've added hydrogen bonds, bonds to them and caused them to be solid fats. And these all cause inflammation. They risk uh, increase your uh, bad cholesterol, they lower your good cholesterol, they increase your risk of heart disease and stroke, and they all cause insulin resistance. When you eat a high fat in the diet, you have changes in your body that happen for three to six hours after the meal. And this includes inflammation in the arteries. It also causes you to have decreased response from your immune system and also puts you at much higher risk for cardiovascular disease. These inflammatory foods are almost like sandblasting the insides of your arteries. Your arteries need to heal themselves. How do they heal themselves? Well, the body takes a smooth substance and coats the area in this smooth substance. That smooth substance is called cholesterol. And so once it's smoothed over the area, then, the, you know, it, it's like a Band-Aid on a cut. If you have lesions that actually occur on the inside of your vessels, um, it'll actually make clots there. Those clots can break loose and float downstream, and you have heart attacks and strokes and things like that. So it's really desirable for us to keep the inflammation in our arteries down. So anyway... When you eat that high-fat meal, the high-fat meal will cause these kind of changes for three to six hours afterward. And the body preferentially burns carbohydrates, but it'll store your fats. So you eat the baked potato. People say, well, you can't have a baked potato. Baked potato will make you fat. The starches in baked potato are glucose. That's it. There's no fructose in your baked potato. 
So your baked potato isn't what makes you fat, but what do you put on your baked potato? There you go. That's what makes you fat. The body burns the glucose and it stores the fat. 2004, Yale University study. By the way, we have a Yale University intern that is with us today, Becca. So glad that she can be here. She's working with us this summer. We had a, a, two interns that worked with us a little bit last summer, and she's come back to do a more intensive study of the program, and uh, we're very happy to have her here. But this study came out of Yale, and they learned that in young individuals, in young college students, when the fat level inside the muscle cell, now muscle cells aren't made for fat, there's not much fat there. But when the fat in the muscle cells became 80% above normal, the individual developed symptoms of diabetes. So uh, that, that was a real breakthrough for us. Then uh, Newcastle University on the t uh, in, in England has been doing a series of studies since 2011 especially. They have been publishing a whole series of studies on diabetes and diabetes reversal. And in their magnetic resonance imaging uh, department, they've been doing research on these people with diabetes and they've discovered what they believe is the mechanism which causes diabetes. When you start developing these accumulations of fat within the cells in the body, something begins to happen to the metabolic process. It's like it gets in the way of the normal insulin signaling methods, uh, and it causes changes downstream. You begin to gain weight in your pancreas, and you also begin to put on extra fat in the liver. And when you reach a th certain threshold level, your metabolism goes haywire and you um, develop the symptoms of diabetes. So they found that everybody has that different fat, hold, uh, fat threshold, but you also have, with the, with the changes in the metabolism that happens, you also have decreased insulin production. It's like when the fat accumulates in the pancreas, it begins shutting down the insulin production capacity. By the time somebody receives the diagnosis of diabetes, they've already shut down to 50% of their capacity. By the time they get down to 20%, they're going to die. So it, it, it follows sort of a depressing, linear, downward slope. And... Uh, is there anything we can do about it? Well, that's what we're here to talk about today because it, they have learned that type 2 diabetes is not inevitably irreversible. We have taught that for years. We, we used to teach that about cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease, once you have it, you got it. It just continues getting worse until you die. And back around 1990, there was that, that scene was blown open, and now it's fairly widely accepted. You can do something about cardiovascular disease, but today there's a lot of people saying, no, once you have diabetes, you're really dealing with a, an injured liver, I mean an injured pancreas, and you're just going to get worse until you die. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to catch them before they get there, or you just have nothing you can do. No, you can do something, folks. There is hope here for the person who has diabetes. We can turn this thing around at least to some degree. Weight loss is absolutely critical if this is going to happen. So, uh, the beta cells, what we found out in, is beta cell function will return to normal. Newcastle took these people and they put them on an 800 calorie a day diet. I don't re recommend that you go that restrictive. Certainly don't do anything like that without talking to your doctor. But, they put them on an 800 calorie diet within seven days insulin, I mean glucose levels normalized. It took six weeks longer before pancreatic function normalized. So right at first, the first thing you're going to have see happen as you begin restricting your caloric intake and you begin trimming off these pounds, you're going to see as the pounds come off, blood sugars gradually begin trending down. Once the blood sugars become normal, you've still got to continue that lifestyle for at least six times longer than however long it took you to get there in order to allow the, the pancreas 
to, to restore it, it, its function. But eventually you'll get there. And what they found out was that 70% of the people that went through this program did not revert back and regain their diabetes again. And those people that maintained the healthy lifestyle, virtually they believe they will be able to live the rest of their lifespan without the disease. Back in 1925, we knew this information. This was published in a book by uh, T. Colin Campbell called The China Study. Some of you may have read that book. But uh, it was comparing the dietary intake of various countries around the world. And the United States had the distinction of having the highest fat intake of any of these countries. We also had the lowest carbohydrate intake of any of these countries. You'll notice on the far end of the spectrum is Japan. Japan's fat intake is very low, and their carbohydrate intake is very high. We've said for years, carbs make you fat. And you hear people say all the time, I'm sure every one of you have heard this, oh, I've got to watch my carbs, I've got to watch my carbs. What are they really saying? They don't know, but what they're really saying is, I've got to watch my fructose intake. It's not the carbs. It's not the glucose. It's the fructose. Fructose minus the fiber, that is. So it's okay if you eat the fructose with the fiber. But anyway, um, fat, is, fat contributes to the diabetes problem. This is a very complex thing. We can talk about one area. We can talk about another area. But it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Whatever we do is impacting this whole life of ours. And we've got to find the, the single best answer out of all this menagerie of scientific evidence to come up with the best possible solution. I think we can help you do that as we go through these, uh, these studies. So, in, the, in 1980, the U.S. government said, woo, look at these numbers about fats and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cancers. I think we need to make some changes here. People are getting too fat, so we need to go with low fat. And so they recommended that we went low fat. Well, what they found was you had one group here, standard American diet. You had another group over here, which was um, those that were eating low fat. Both groups continuing to get fatter. They said, why? And continuing to get fatter at virtually the same rate. Well, you see, the food manufacturers took the fat out of the food. When they took the fat out of it, fat carries flavor and it carries satiety. We need fats in our food. We just need the right way to blend them all together. But they took the fat out. And then the food tasted real bland. So they say, well, we have to add something back into the food to make the food taste better. So what did they add back into the food? Sugar. And what is the cheapest sugar that's available out there? Fructose. High fructose corn syrup. And so you, eat, you, you read every bottle of low-fat salad dressing you can find. What does it say? High fructose corn syrup, just about every one of them will, unless you're going to a specialty store. That's what you're going to see. And the same thing for just about every low-fat food preparation that you see, the manufactured food. So I recommend that you don't eat those, but instead you, uh, you eat the foods that are low-fat naturally. May just select different foods. So anyway... Um, so what, what, what really works? Well, the scientists have studied this quite a bit for the last 10 or 15 years, and they've decided that the thing that does work is something that we call food patterns. For instance, a food pattern that, well, food patterns are defined as the quantities, proportions, variety, and combinations of different foods and beverages and diets, and the frequency with which they are habitually consumed. And so... Um, The, they, they said, well, what are these food patterns? Well, one you're well acquainted with is probably the Mediterranean food pattern. 
uh, you know that it'll, they'll be high in fruit, uh, vegetables. Um, they'll have lentils. Yeah, what else is in a Mediterranean diet? Yeah, see, you guys know all this stuff. Okay, that's a food pattern. Well, the, is there an optimal food pattern for diabetes? And with the 2016 dietary regulations that were just voted January 7th of this year, 2016, the, uh, they, they, they came out and they identified a number of various food patterns that appeared to be optimal for various disorders, like cardiovascular disease, for instance. Well, here's the food pattern that they say is helpful for persons with diabetes. It needs to be a diet that's high in vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. This is U.S. government talking. And your diet needs to be low in red and processed meats. In fact, they, they, they recommend that you eliminate the processed meats altogether. It needs to be high, uh, I mean, it needs to be low in high fat dairy products and refined grains and sweets and sugar sweetened beverages, while at the same time, you need to main, maintain a healthy weight. And if you do those things, then you are going to be okay. Dr. Joel Furman is, in my book, a genius. He ranks right up there with men like Albert Einstein, who came up with the formula E equals MC squared. Well, Dr. Furman has come up with a formula that's H equals N over C, where H equals your future health. He says your future health equals nutrients over calories. You have to get the high nutrients in your system. Nutrients are going to stop inflammation. They're going to heal the body. They're going to uh, help us process our foods. They're going to make you healthy. And when you eat more nutrients in relation to the calories, you're going to do much better. Now, what do we do in uh, our society today? Well, we eat a lot of high-calorie foods, a lot of fried foods, a lot of processed foods that have the fibers removed. And uh, consequently, we have ourselves in a world of hurt. Well, in the next session, we will go over the food classification list. But this really is really exciting because it helps you identify what those high-nutrient foods are. The food classification list is divided into three sections. There's going to be first-class foods, second-class foods, and third-class foods. The first-class foods will all be healing foods. These foods will make your diabetes better if eaten in the right proportions. The second-class foods are sort of an intermediate class, and they're not going to help a whole lot to reverse your diabetes, but they're not going to hurt you a whole lot either uh, unless you eat them in wrong proportions. And then the third-class foods are foods that you really ought to eliminate from your diet. Those will be foods that make you sick. So the hi higher you go the list, the better off you're going to be. The lower you go down the list, the worse you're going to be. And uh, Dr. Wes Youngberg is another uh, very um, highly respected um, scientist or uh, doctor as far as I'm concerned. He's written the book, Goodbye Diabetes, and he developed this food list. He's given us permission to use it in our seminars, and uh, we're very grateful to him for that. But his book is called Goodbye Diabetes. It's available across the street at the bookstore, but you can also get it uh, you know, on Amazon.com or wherever you go to get your books. Uh, it's widely available now. And uh, so that, that's another source for those of you that are, uh, don't have access to the food list. You can get it from that source. Uh, a few years back, uh, Hippocrates said, let thy food be thy medicine, and thy medicine thy food. And uh, there's really a tremendous amount of truth to that. Dr. Joel, I mean, uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell says, 75% of disease is preventable with diet alone. The reason for that is that is the greatest way that we can interact with our environment. So we've really got to pay attention to our food if we want to live well and healthfully. What, what do we need to do about this fat problem? How can we address fats healthfully? Well, the best way I could think of to, to put it to you is eat low-fat naturally. Um, 
search for new recipes. Eat simply. You know, some of, the, some of these foods out there have been prepared and processed, and you looked at the, at the ingredient list, and it's just huge, all the food additives that are in there. The more food additives you have in the food, probably the less healthful it is for you. But learn how to combine these natural foods together so you have that aha moment. Oh, that was good. Look at your table as though the table is a piece of artwork. Eat every color of the rainbow every day. If you can remember some of these phrases as you're preparing your meals, you'll put foods on that really look, look good and uh, do quite well. Uh, select whole foods, plant-based foods. These are the ones that are going to be chocked so full of nutrients, and it's those high-nutrient foods that you really need in order to reverse the, the disease. Eat nuts and seeds in moderation. Uh, you can use nuts, um, especially the raw nuts, seem to have uh, a better effect on helping people reverse the diabetes. So learn how to do dressings that are made with raw, uh, raw nuts and seeds. Dr. Joel Furman actually has a website out there, and he has recipes that are available on the website, or if you happen to get the, a copy of the book, uh, The End of Diabetes, that has some initial recipes that you can use for salad dressings. Use things like avocados and uh, um, maybe even a mango. We just recently had a salad at home. It was absolutely fantastic. Had a blend of lettuces. There was red lettuce, red romaine, red curly leaf lettuce. There was, uh, uh, I think, uh, bib lettuce, and there was some butterhead. They were all mixed in together in some spinach. And then uh, there was a ripe mango and a ripe avocado and some finely sliced green onions and uh, a tiny bit of feta cheese. Now you talk about a good salad. Oh, my, my. And when you stirred that together... It's like the avocado, the ripe avocado and the ripe mango just coated the leaves with flavor. And it's just like, you know, we, we, we served it on our plates and ate that and reached for seconds. And it's like, you know, you, you feel like when you're reaching out there, your hand's in danger because someone's coming down with their fork. They're going to get you anyway. Uh, that, that's good stuff. And that's the kind of reaction you like to have at the meal table. You know, people want to eat that. It's just an invitation. And so it was very colorful, very beautiful. I may show you a picture of that later on. Um, but things to avoid. Avoid high-fat foods, your highly processed foods. And, uh, you know, you need to be careful, too, even about things like condiments. Why a condiment? Mayonnaise. What's mayonnaise made out of? Eggs and oil, pretty much it few little seasonings thrown in, maybe a tiny bit of vinegar or whatever, but eggs and oil. What is mustard made out of? Do you, do you know um, salad dressings, even low-fat salad dressings, have a high-fat, I mean high-oil content? I'm not saying a person should never use oil. In fact, we use a very scant amount of it in our home, but we try to make sure that it is scant, and Karen's learned wonderful ways of expand, uh, ex, uh, changing recipes, adapting, so that we use less of those refined oils, just simply for health's sake. And we are doing better and better as we go, go into the process and learn more and more about this. Just remember that high fat, regardless of the kind of fat, causes insulin resistance. So we need to reduce the overall fat, but yet not be scared of it. And when you, when, when you take your foods as God created them and learn how to combine those foods together, then the dishes can be absolutely beautiful, absolutely mouth-watering. You just have to select or discover, search until you have discovered a bunch of recipes. Now, we have, we have a new growing website. It's called GrundyRDS.org. And uh, if, if you hit it today, you might be a little disappointed, but uh, it has some recipes on it. 
It's, it, it's still being developed. We've been working on program pro uh, proper while some interns were working on doing this for us. So it is half-baked yet, but it's still coming out. Uh, it, there's also some links on there. If you can find the links, uh, hit up the links. It'll be links to things like uh, full plate diet and uh, forks over knives and uh, some government uh, place and happy herbivore and anyway just a lot of wonderful links you can go to to have very attractive recipes and these websites some of them have just gorgeous pictures there and the foods well they are all awesome most of them so anyway uh, this is a good way of living we're not talking about eating bad stuff you might have to try new flavors a new texture something like that but it is an adventure that has been fun all the way. So I hope that you will enjoy that as you move into it. And remember that your future health equals nutrients over calories. So try to gravitate to the high-nutrient foods. 